My research is mainly around identity, social identities. My work is mainly known for my work on gender, um, in terms of both gender and achievement and kids' classroom identities and around their gender identities. But I've also, within that I suppose, looked at social class and ethnicity as well. And another big piece of research I did was looking at ethnicity and educational achievement and I've focused a lot on the British Chinese and their educational success. My latest piece of research has been on high achievement um, because there tends to be a focus on underachieving kids and why aren't they achi um, yeah, achieving. Um, so I've looked at the ones that are achieving and particularly high achieving popular pupils to see what it is they're doing that means that they seem to be able to have their cake and eat it too. Um, the sorts of questions I'm looking at are why do some children seem to do better than others educationally? Um, why do some children seem to be more popular than others in the classroom? What kind of education capitals help to allow children to succeed, both socially and in terms of their achievement? And also how gender, race and social class get constructed in social interaction within education contexts. Underlying all that, of course, I'm interested as a sociologist in why the educational institutions reproduce inequality systematically as they do. Well, my own methods tend to be qualitative. They tend to involve going into classrooms, observing classes, both the teaching and the learning, um, even observing playground and lunchtime activity to observe children's social worlds, I suppose. Um, and also a lot of individual interviewing of pupils to hear about their opinions and their experiences. Sometimes some focus group work to hear about children as a collective group and what they think as a group. Um, but of course contextualising all this um, will be statistical analysis of achievement rates according to gender, race, social class and so on. There's a couple of things actually. One of the slightly depressing findings has been that most of the kids that seem to be able to balance high achievement and popular popularity tend to be good looking and tend to be very fashionable and sort of aware of their own style and also very sociable and confident and we're suggesting that maybe their good looks facilitates this confidence and the self-assurance. Um, but beyond that, what I would argue is that kids are perpetually working at their performance of themselves, just as we are as adults as well. Um, and that this is actually quite laboured work <laughs> for, for high achieving popular pupils. They've got to juggle a number of different plates, as it were. Um, they've got to carry on being social, maintain their um, social sort of interaction in the classroom, as well as the learning element and their engagement with the teacher. They can't be too naughty, but they can't be too good. And um, so they've got to maintain this very careful balance at all times. And I'm very interested in gender, obviously, and one of the key findings is that they're working very hard at their sort of traditional constructions of gender to underpin their popularity. As I would put it, the girls are working very hard at doing girl in quite stereotypical ways, and the boys are working very hard at doing boy. And underpinning that, of course, is heterosexuality, which they're all producing very conscientiously all the time. In terms of my studies over the years, there are some very broad things we could be saying to teachers like don't stereotype according to gender, don't set low expectations relating to minority ethnic kids and, and working class kids, you know, 
th th those kind of obvious statements to teachers, really. But in terms of this latest study looking at high achievement and popularity, teachers might say, well, what can we do? You know, if, if kids are just good looking and that helps them to be popular, how on earth can we do anything about that? And that might be a fair question. <laughs> I would say that we as educationalists need to be much more aware of these classroom hierarchies and the different factors that children are having to balance in their little school, you know, their sort of social worlds in the school. And I do think we need to look again at the way that the school as an institution, which is set up economically really with one teacher and 30 kids across classes, really facilitates these hierarchies um, of sociability for kids um, in ways that really are quite problematic, I think. My early work in 1999 and 2000 was some of the first sociological work to look at this term lads. Um, and certainly children feel that there is a real pressure for them, especially for boys, to dumb down, not to um, work too hard, not to be diligent and too obedient, but rather to be more rebellious and hedonistic. And I think Karen was absolutely right that this is a pressure for girls to some extent as well. Um, I think that my findings show that there are ways that kids can work to get around some of these problems and work to balance popularity and achievement. And we know this, of course, because we know that there are children who are high achieving and popular, and my study has really just accentuated that. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there are strong pressures on kids to conform for girls to dumb down, not to show their too innately intelligent, you know, cleverness is seen as unfeminine, and for boys um, to be too diligent and obedient is seen to be unmasculine. So both of those can have bad connotations for achievement, if you like. Well, my work with Louise Archer is probably some of the first sociological work to look at the children of Chinese heritage in British education. They are the highest um, achieving group, including, you know, they achieve higher than white children. And they're also the best represented in higher education, including elite, in elite universities. How things progress after that is much more questionable, and there's been research showing that there's a glass ceiling for them when they leave university. But that being said, they are very educationally successful. And we've shown that there is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Many, many teachers expect them to do very well as a stereotype of the high-achieving Chinese student, which a lot of kids of Chinese heritage find a great pressure, actually, and rather offensive, that they're always just expected to do well and that it's easy for them. And meanwhile, Chinese kids also experience a lot of racism, unfortunately, and this is not perceived by their teachers. Um, I think the teachers tend to think Chinese kids don't have problems in the British education system, and they patently do. And the other thing is that many of the kids of Chinese heritage that we talked to felt that they were stereotyped as sort of boffins and swats, or, if not, teachers thought that they must be sort of triads or, you know, involved in crime. It was like a, a dualism. Either they're very, very good or they must be really bad. Um, and so they were facing quite a lot of problems, actually, despite their very high achievement. What Louise and I argue is rather than it being simply about Chinese culture, because there do tend to be assumptions that Confucianism um, encourages a love of learning and so on, but of course, yeah, if you look at Hong Kong or China, not all kids are doing well. Um, I think that what, what we found was that the Chinese community in Britain has alighted on this discourse of Chinese as valuing education as something that distinguishes them from other groups. So it's part of their building of this sort of diaspora, diaspora community in Britain we are, you know, we, the Chinese community, focus on this, and so that these practices are particularly heightened for Chinese here in Britain. And there are some other cultural practices around the notion of good face, where children's exam credentials are held up, you know, competitively with other families and so on, which do help to push this high achievement. 
educational sociologists, this is a generalisation, but I think it's a fair one. I think the attention is right back on class because finally policymakers have started picking up on what sociologists of education and particularly feminists have been saying for a very long time that the key education gaps and achievement are not gendered ones, they're around socio-economic background. And although gender and ethnicity come into play as factors in that, it's social class that's the key predictor of educational achievement.